My Life in Art by Konstantin Stanislavsky, abridged, read by Vincent Bagnall. Old Russia. I was born in Moscow in 1863, a time that may well be taken as a dividing point between two great epochs. I remember the landmarks of the age of serfdom, its icons and icon lamps, its lard candles, its pony express, that peculiar Russian conveyance called the Tarantas, the flintlock muskets, the cannon that were small enough to be mistaken for playthings. My eyes have witnessed the coming of electric projectors, railroads, and express trains, automobiles, aeroplanes, steamboats, submarines, the telegraph, the radio, and the 16-inch gun. In such wise, from the lard candle to the electric projector, from the tarantas to the aeroplane, from the sailboat to the submarine, from the pony express to the radio, from the flintlock to the Big Bertha, from serfdom to communism and Bolshevism, I have lived a variegated life. During the course of which I have been forced more than once to change my most fundamental ideas. I remember the story of my ancestors who came from the glebe filled with a strength that was the accumulated result of centuries and lived through their lives in an incomplete way, unable to take advantage of their natural endowments. Their blood flows in me and I would like to tell what I remember of their life, of the life of the old generation and its strong spirits. Here is one ship of the past, a figure astounding in its wholesomeness and strength. One of my aunts became dangerously ill when she was very old. Feeling the approach of death, she ordered the servants to carry her into the parlor. Cover the mirrors, the candelabra, and the drapery with canvas, she commanded. The servants hastened to obey her. The dying woman lay in the middle of the room and continued to order them about. Put the table for the coffin here. Take the plants to the greenhouse. Put this near the table. That is not right. This to the right, and this to the left. At last the table was ready to receive the coffin, and the plants were arranged to her taste. She looked about the room with darkening eyes. A carpet, she commanded, but not a new one. They brought the carpet. Put it here for the readers of prayers. He mustn't spit on the floor. Let everybody dress in mourning. The dying woman continued in a weak voice that was almost hushed to a whisper. The servants hurriedly left the room, and after a while filed, one after the other, before their mistress. You fool! Why have you tightened that dress? The old woman whispered angrily. Have it remodeled at once! Why did you shorten it, blockhead? She murmured to another. Fix the thing at once, or you will be late, fool. She hissed in anger at a third girl, but her voice refused to obey her will. Her eyes could no longer see, and having prepared everything and everybody for her death, she died in the same room that very day. And here is the story of a paladin with a restless soul who seems to have stepped out of the pages of the brothers Kamarazov. The son of a famous merchant, he harbored in himself much good and much evil, and the two sides of his nature continually warred against each other, creating a chaos in his soul that neither he nor his friends could analyze. He was clever and strong and able and courageous and kind and lazy and meandersome and evil and attractive and repulsive. All his actions, his entire life, were unreasonable and illogical, 
No sooner would he settle down to work and quiet than he would leave everything for the sake of a tiger hunt. From one of these tiger hunts, he brought home a small tiger cub. And soon the cub grew into a well-sized beast, and the man could find no greater pleasure in life than training the tiger in full view of his terrified household. The tiger escaped, clearing a fence between his estate and ours. There was a city-wide scandal. The tiger was caught and immured in a zoological garden, and his owner was fined. But he immediately imported another tiger cub, which soon became a ferocious tigress. The shouts of the trainer and the roars of the beast again re-echoed throughout the house. The servants came demanding that the beast be done away with, to which the trainer quietly replied, Take her, if you can. Family life. The generation to which my parents belonged consisted of people who had already crossed the threshold of culture and who, although they did not receive the benefits of higher education and in the majority of cases were educated privately, still made much of culture their own thanks to their innate abilities. They were conscious creators of the new life. Numberless schools, hospitals, asylums, nurseries, learned societies, museums, and our institutions were founded by their money, their initiative, and even their creative effort. For instance, the famous clinics of Moscow, large enough to constitute a city in themselves, were built mostly by the initiative and the money of these men and their heirs. They made money in order to spend it on social and artistic institutions, and all this was done in a spirit of humility. My father, a rich manufacturer and merchant, the owner of a mercantile firm a hundred years old, Sergei Vladimirovich Alexiev, was a pure-blooded Russian. My mother, Elizaveta Vasilyevna Alexieva, had a Russian father and a French mother. The once famous actress Varley, who played in Petrograd in her time as a visiting star, this actress married the rich owner of a quarry in Finland, Vasily Abramovich Yakovlev, who erected the famous Column of Alexander in the Palace Square in Petrograd. A family tradition has it that when the pillar was being transported by sea from Finland, the ship was caught in a storm. During that night, Yakovlev grew gray, for Tsar Nikolai I, a man of very short moods, had ordered that the column be placed in the square on time. Every means known to the art of navigation was used to save the ship, which hardly escaped sinking. Varley soon separated from Yakovlev, leaving him two children, my mother and an aunt. Yakovlev married a woman who had a Turkish mother and a Greek father, and this woman practically brought up my mother. Her house was conducted in a very aristocratic fashion. It seems that the court manners acquired by her from her mother, who was stolen from the Turkish sultan's harem, at last showed themselves. And this Turkish woman had been shipped by her Greek husband from Constantinople in a box. It was only after the ship that carried them was safely out of the reach of the sublime port that the box was opened and the Heramite freed. My mother's sister, who married my father's brother, was very like her Turkish stepmother. They gave famous dinners and balls, and the most prominent merchants felt honored to be invited to these. For members of the aristocratic circle, 
often appeared at them. At this time, the aristocracy was still shy of the merchant class, and the breaking of class prejudices was considered a signal honor in our circles of society. I remember those balls. Instead of tablecloths, there were roses brought by express trains from Nice and Italy. The guests would arrive in four in hands and six in hands, with their lackeys sitting stiff in their liveries, in the back seats and astride the horses. Bonfires would be lighted in the street opposite the house to keep the horses warm, and the drivers were served food as they gathered around the fires. The lower stories of the house were given over for the entertainment of the servants. The ladies came with necks and bosoms covered with jewels, and those who liked to figure out the riches of others would be busy appraising the value of the gems. And those who seemed to be the poorest in the company considered themselves unhappy and were ashamed of their poverty. The richer women believed themselves the queens of the ball, more than a few tears were shed because of the prevalence of poverty among the millionaires. My brother and I were taken to the Italian opera in our earliest childhood, when we were six, or at most eight years old, and I'm very thankful to my parents, for I have no doubts that it acted beneficially on my musical hearing, on the development of my taste and on my eye, which grew used to the beautiful. We had season tickets which entitled us to be present at 40 or 50 performances, and we sat in the orchestra very near to the stage. But as we often said at the time, the opera was merely a sideline for us, and we begged our parents not to count it as part of our regular theatrical fare, especially the circus. Music made us tired. Nevertheless, the impressions I received of the opera are still alive in me and are much clearer, sharper and greater than the impressions left by the circus. I think that this is so because the strength of the impressions in itself was tremendous, but was not felt consciously. Being received organically, and not only spiritually, but physically also, I began to understand and value these impressions at their true worth only much later in my memory. But... The circus amused me in childhood, although memories of it were of no interest to me in my maturer years. I remember many of the operas I saw at that time and the casts that appeared in them. My impressions of the Italian opera are sealed not alone in my visual or oral memory, for I still feel them physically. When I feel them, I experience again that physical state which was created in me by the supernormally high and silvery note of Adelina Patti, by her coloratura and technique, which made me hold my breath, by her full chest tones, which caused my spirit to swoon and brought a smile of satisfaction to my lips. And together with this, there is sealed in my memory her exquisite little figure and her profile that seemed to be cut from ivory and had something porcelain-like about it, something that pleased my childish fancy. The same organically physical impression is sealed in my memory by the elemental force of the king of baritones, Katagni, and the basso Giametta. I still tremble when I think of them, at such times I remember a charity concert in the house of one of my acquaintances. In a little parlor, the two paladins sang the duet from the Puritan, drowning the room in a velvety stream of sounds that poured into the soul, making it drunk with the passions of the South. Giametta had the face of a Mephistopheles and a tremendous handsome figure. Katagni with an open and kindly face and an enormous scar on his cheek, was healthy, virile, and also handsome in his own way. The strength of the impression left on me by Katagni in my youth is almost indescribable. In 1910, that is almost 40 years after his arrival in Moscow, I was in Rome, walking with a friend through some narrow alley or other. Suddenly, from the top story of one of the houses, there floated out a note, 
broad, ringing, stormy, warming and exciting. And I felt again physically the old, familiar impression. Katagni, I cried. Yes, he lives here, affirmed my friend. How did you recognize him? He wondered. I felt him, I answered. That note could never be forgotten. I tell of these impressions because it is important for the development of this book that my reader live through with me my impressions from the sphere of sound, music, rhythm, and the voice. In my career and in my work, they were fated to play a large part. I found this out not long ago, already at the sunset of my artistic career. I understood at last the meaning of my childish impressions, elemental and tremendous. They were the signposts that led me, and not so long ago at that, to the study of the voice, to its placement, to the nobility of sound and diction, to rhythmical musical intonation, to a true view of the soul of vowels, consonants, words, phrases, sentences, and speech. All of this is demanded for a true understanding of dramatic art. But I will treat of it in detail later on. Meanwhile, let my reminiscences leave a trail in the memory of my reader. I mention all these memories also to show young artists how important it is for us to take in as many beautiful and strong impressions as we can. The artist must look at, not only look at, but know how to see the beautiful in all the spheres of his own art, of all other arts, and of life. He needs impressions of good performances, art, concerts, museums, voyages, and pictures of all tendencies, from the most academic to the most futuristic, for no one knows what will move his soul and open the treasure house of his creative gifts. All tendencies are good which help to create the beautiful life of the human spirit in artistic forms, that is, which reached the fundamental goal of art. Let the artist live, let him be enchanted, disappointed, happy. Let him suffer, love, and live through the entire gamut of human emotions, but let him at the same time learn to recreate his life and his emotions into art. From the memories of my childish emotions and experiences, those that have remained with me longest have to do with the need of spectacles and satisfaction. Let me but resurrect in memory some of the circumstances of my early life, and I seem to grow younger again and feel the old, familiar emotions surge through me. Here is the eye in the morning of a holiday. Before me is the day of freedom. In the morning one must go again to church, rising early. One must make the best of that. Then there is a long period of standing, the tasty holy water, the tasty holy wafer, the winter sun warming us through the cupola and gilding the iconostasis. Around us people in their holiday best, loud singing, and before us a day full of joy. And that is necessary to uphold our energy during the long procession of dull school days and weary evenings that lie before us. Nature demands satisfaction, joy, and a holiday. And he who stands in the way of it causes anger and evil thoughts to rise in the soul. While he who helps it along earns tender gratefulness and a caress. The small wing of the house on our estate near Moscow, where I made my debut on the stage at the age of two or three, rotted away, and it was decided to put up another building in its place. We were sad to see the building go, for it was full of memories of our childhood. It was the only place where we could dance, sing, and make a noise without getting into the way of others. Not only we, but the neighbors begged our father not to destroy our club. At last it was decided to put up a new building with a large hall 
which, when necessary, could be transformed into an auditorium. I think that our father had in mind our love for the theater. Perhaps he was also urged to hold us nearer to the paternal hearth. Whatever the case, everything seemed to encourage our secret love for the theater. Not only the hall with its balcony that served instead of boxes, but even the back part of the building was wonderfully arranged and gave space for dressing rooms, scenery, and properties. The result was a little theater, and near it there was a large lawn that seemed to be just made for illumination and landscape effects. A little farther out, the river was ripe for our water festivals. We even dreamed of making a new hermitage a la Lentovsky. It was very much in fashion just then. Perhaps it was an heirloom from our French grandmother actress, but all of us, brothers and sisters, seemed to be possessed with a love for the theater, which we even came to call Theatroline. All our spare time was devoted to the theater. All our dreams were about the production of this or that play. At first, we did the thing without any special preparations, and the cost was covered by the modest sums we received from our parents for pocket money. But having seen various European wonders, our tastes became sharper and we began to demand more of our artistic efforts. The direction and acting plays were not within our means, either financial or artistic. What could we do without real technique, without real knowledge of the stage, and even without material for scenery and costumes? Outside of the old clothes of our parents and our sisters and friends, of some few ribbons, buttons, and other things like that, we had nothing. And somehow, we did not want to ask our parents for money. Willy-nilly, we were forced to replace the luxury of costume and scenery by the unexpectedness of artistic imagination, originality, and unusualness. A director was necessary, but since there was none, and we wanted badly to play, it was necessary for me to become a stage director myself. Life and necessity taught us and made us pass through the most practical school of all, experience. To illustrate that crooked line which the work of an amateur takes without the direction of a specialist, I will explain the succession of steps or stages passed by the actor in attaining his creative maturity and understanding and the rises and falls in the crooked line of his progress which distinguish it from the true and fundamental highway of his growth. The building of the new wing to our house was nearing its end. It was necessary to open the theater with some sort of performance. Our tutor, a student who considered himself somewhat of a specialist in theatrical affairs, as he was the leader of a dramatic circle, took the stage direction on himself. Our productions were few and far between, and in the interim, we suffered from having no artistic work to do. In order to assuage our artistic thirst, we would engage in the following things. As soon as evening would arrive, we would make ourselves up as beggars or drunkards and go to the station. There we would frighten everybody, and more than once the watchmen would chase us from the platform. The worse they treated us, the more we were satisfied. For in life one must be more subtle and truth-like than on the stage, where illusion is almost ready-made for you. If we were not good actors, we could get into trouble. But since we were chased away, we must have played our parts well. And our greatest success came to us in the roles of gypsies, a passing gypsy camp that had stopped between our estate and the station gave us the proper clue for making costumes. Gypsy women and children could be seen on every road near the summer residences. One evening we expected a cousin, a beautiful young woman, who was in love with a neighbor of ours and with whom all of us were in love. We know that she liked to be told her fortune. Not long before her arrival, a new governess appeared in our house with whom our cousin was still acquainted. And the new governess told fortunes brilliantly. Having told her all the secrets of my cousin, I, she, and the small son of one of the maids secretly assumed the guise of gypsies. We walked on the road to the station, and meeting my cousin in her carriage, we started running after her, shouting something in a broken 
gypsy jargon. The young woman was frightened and ordered the coachman to get her home as quickly as possible. Having reached the house and told one of my brothers the secret, we waited near the gates. Soon the excited young woman and her family came to visit us. Putting her hand through a break in the fence, she asked for her fortune to be told. She was told everything. The effect was indescribable. Then somebody suddenly cried that he had lost a ring. The gypsies stole it. Search them. We began to run to the wood, followed by the entire crowd. But my cousin, pleased by what he had told her, had managed to put a small diamond pin in the hand of the governess. Next day, this pin suddenly appeared on my cousin's dress. Mystification, conversations, guesses, and then new mischief. There was a time when we could not arrange any performances, but we wanted to play very much. And so we, that is my two sisters, my friend and I, decided to rehearse by ourselves for the sake of practice two vaudeville skits translated from the French, The Weak String and A Woman's Secret. Much later I learned that our precursors, the famous actors of the Russian stage, were not brought up in tragedies which force youth to tear passion to tatters and overstrain the abilities of the young novice, but in the simplest vaudeville skits. The French vaudeville act enjoyed special honor, but it demanded good technique, inner and outer agility, faultless diction, elegance, and a verve that gave the skit the necessary piquancy, just as sparkling gas gives champagne its taste. Without tearing passion to tatters, without straining the soul of youth, the old school first worked out its technique by means of the vaudeville skit, and only after that technique was present did it pass on to the more difficult problems of the spirit. Russian Dramatic Schools in order to create a position for oneself, my uncle and cousin told me it is necessary for you to occupy yourself with some sort of social work. You must become the honorary president of some school or of a poorhouse or a member of the Duma. And from that time, my sufferings began. I went to some sort of meetings and tried to look imposing and important. I feigned interest in the question of what kind of waists or bonnets were made for the old women in the poorhouse, and in the progress made by my school, I thought out some strange methods for the betterment of child education in Russia, without knowing a single thing about what I was doing. With great artfulness, like an actor, I learned how to keep silent in a wise manner when I did not understand what was said to me, and to pronounce the following with an air of great meaningfulness. Hmm, yes, I will think of it. I learned to listen to others' opinions and then cleverly make them my own. It seems that I played the part very well, for every charitable institution in the city began to ask for my services. I never had time to attend to everything. I became tired, and my soul was filled with coldness and sourness, and a feeling that I was engaged in evil work. I was not doing my own work, and I could find no satisfaction in what I was doing. I was making a career of which I stood in no need whatsoever. Nevertheless, my new activities took greater and greater hold of me, and I could not refuse to continue fulfilling the tasks I had undertaken. Happily for me, a solution was found. My cousin, who was a very active director in the Russian Musical Society and Conservatory, founded by Nikolai Rubinstein, was forced to leave his post for a higher one. No one could be found to take his place, except myself. I took the position so as to be able to get rid of all the others on the ground of lack of time. It was better to occupy myself with a strange affair in artistic circles among interesting people than in poorhouses and schools which were not only alien to me but unbearable. At that time, the conservatory was filled with really interesting people. It is enough to say that among my co-directors were the composer Peter Tchaikovsky, the composer and pianist Tenev, one of the founders of the Tretyakovskaya 
Gallery, Sergei Tretyakov, and among the professors preparing future artists, men like Vasily Safanyev, well known even in America. At about this time there visited Moscow the famous tragedian Ernesto Rosi. He played throughout Lent in the great theater, surrounded by a second-rate troupe. In those days, performances in Russia were forbidden during Lent, but performances in foreign languages were allowed. And this explains Rossi's presence in the great theater at that time. The Little Theater Understanding the superlative qualities of dramatic art in the sense of the breadth and depth of its problems, and conscious of the difficulties of studying this art, I gave all my thoughts, my time, and my material wealth to it. At that time, the temple of dramatic art was our beloved imperial little theater, which was nicknamed the House of Shetepkin, just as the Paris Comédie Française was dubbed the House of Molière. The teachings of Shetepkin still lived within the walls of that theater. They were striking in their simplicity and amazing in their artistic truth. There was the real atmosphere of art, which formed a broad, free, artistic soul, better than any prison-like academy could. I can bravely affirm that I received my education not in the gymnasia, but in the little theater. I prepared myself for every performance there. For this purpose, there was originally a small group of young people who read in common each play produced in the theater, who studied all that was written about the play and formed their own opinions, and then went as a group to the theater, and after the performance and a series of discussions, exchanged their impressions and their thoughts and established their own evaluations of the play. Then they could go see the play again and discuss it anew. But these discussions very often proved our ignorance of the varied problem of art and knowledge. We tried to correct our ignorance by making researches and conducting lectures. The little theater became the lever which controlled the spiritual and intellectual side of our life. To this admiration of the little theater, there was added the idolization of its individual actors and actresses. The common idol was the great pride of the Russian stage, Maria Nikolaevna Yermolova, whom God still spares to us. In view of the fact that we consider ourselves the heirs of Shtepkin, let me say a few words about his house. The brightest pages in the book of the Little Theatre had been written before my time, but I still managed to see the last glorious chapters chronicled. I saw the wonderful, extraordinary artists of the Little Theatre, full in their glory, spoiled in my childhood by Italian opera that consisted only of stars. I was spoiled in my youth by the copious wealth of talents in the Little Theatre. How could these shining pages of art remain a secret from Europe that looked down upon us at that time, and from America, which was not interested in us? That period in the life of our theater could be well compared with the theater of Moliere, Shakespeare, Galdoni, Gazi, Schroeder, Goethe, Schiller, and the Weimar Theater. We were creating our own school, our own actors and dramatists and poets like Pushkin, Lermontov, Gogol, Gribiedov, Ostrovsky, Turgenev, Pizemsky, Chernyshevsky, and countless others. Have you ever noticed that in theatrical life there come long, torturing periods of inactivity during which there appear no new and talented writers on the horizon, no actors, no stage directors, and then suddenly, unexpectedly, nature spews forth a whole theatrical troupe and adds to it, out of its bounty, a writer and a stage director, who all together create that wonder and epic in the theater. And at once, to balance the scales, there appear their opponents, who try to destroy the new enterprise with their own, even newer one. But fashion changes. The eternal remains.
the professional theater. In my quest for a helper in the theater of which I was dreaming, with whom I might share the reins of rule and the complex theatrical affair, and who might become the administrator and one of the founding directors of the theater, and also in my quest for actors who might fill out the skeleton of our troupe, I turned to professional actors and managers and tried to make several productions with them. For instance, I took upon myself the production of Gogol's Inspector General at one of the summer theaters near Moscow. I came to the rehearsal and was met with honor, although at that time I was only a beginning amateur. Who does not know the properties and the mise-en-scene of the Inspector General? Everything was in its place, the divan, the chair, and every smallest trifle. The rehearsal progressed smoothly so that it seemed that the actors had played together hundreds of times. There was not a single intonation, not a single trait that was created by themselves, but all the stencils fixed once and forever, against which Gogol has himself protested so vigorously in his well-known letter on the production of the Inspector General. Purposely, I did not stop the actors, and after the end of the first act, paid them many compliments and said that there was nothing left for me but to come to the performance and applaud. For the production was ready and only waiting for posters, a full house and the rise of the curtain. But if they wanted to play the real Gogol, as I understood him, then nothing that they had done from the very beginning to the very end was of any use. The actors insisted that they wanted my manner of production and were ready to change everything, as I told them to do. Then let us begin, I said, mounting the stage. This divan is at the left. Put it on the right. The exit is on the right. Put it in the center. You began acting here on the divan. Go to the other side. It was in such manner that I talked to professional actors with all the despotism that was part of me then. Now we will begin, I said, having purposely converted the whole stage. The confused actors with long and surprised faces walked to the other side of the stage and were lost in amazement as to where they were to sit down. I helped them, for they were completely helpless in the creation of a new mise-en-scene. And what further? One was lost. And where do I go now? asked another. How am I to say this sentence? a third asked me, having lost all his aplomb and seemingly turned into a simple amateur. I began to order the actors about exactly as I ordered about amateurs. Of course, they did not like it. But they obeyed, for they lost all ground beneath their feet. What I said and what I wanted was right. I saw the truth of that in the following years in many productions of The Inspector General. But the means I used for attaining my new ideas and influencing the actors were not the right ones. Simple despotism does not persuade an actor in his inner self. It only violates his inner self. A black cat seemed to have run between us already. I found out personally the meaning of actors' intrigues, gossip, undermining, and what the Americans call kidding. I also came to know that it is much easier to destroy the old than to create the new. The performance was not successful, but for the actors had no time to unlearn the old and to make the new their own. I had taught them nothing. I only disturbed them. But they had taught me a great deal. My first experience with professional actors was far from successful. My second attempt was much more successful. One very well-known manager, a man of much talent, intuition, and experience, but of course, like all professional theatrical men, eaten through by theatrical rust, invited me to produce Hauptmann's Hanel in the tremendous theater of Saladav Nikov. This production was in preparation at the very time of the coronation of Nikolai II. The work 
was responsible as not only Russians would come to see it, but foreigners also. Besides the opportunity that this offered me to become known to a wide public, I also wanted to learn the methods of work of the famous manager. Perhaps he was that director whom I was seeking. This took place during Lent, when actors from every corner of the provinces had come to Moscow to get engagements for the following season. I was invited to take part in the making up of the company and to examine the actors who were to be hired for the coming performance. At the appointed hour, I came to the address given to me and found myself in a store that had just been left by its ruined owner. Dirt, rubbish, paper, broken boxes, shelves, an old dive-in with broken arms and back, several armchairs in the same condition, old advertisements of manufactured goods, a circular stairway that led to a low attic with a dirty window and a ceiling which I continually struck with my head, and a mass of old boxes. Here on some boxes sat the manager with his assistant. People came to him, poor, ragged, dirty people, to whom he spoke very familiarly. Come, show me your leg, the assistant said to a young girl. Hire, you need a good leg for tights. It's not so bad. Show me your bust. The confused girl took off her coat in the unheated kennel and tried to look as stately as she could. Show me your voice. Sing. I am a dramatic actress. I don't sing. Write her down as a beggar, the manager decided. The young actress moved her head in assent and walked out. They began calling in others, but I stopped them, closed the door, and asked for any explanation. Pardon me. I began as tenderly and caressingly as I could. I can't continue this work. Do you think that one can occupy himself with art and aesthetics in a pigsty? Aesthetics has its demands, which must be fulfilled even if they are very badly fulfilled. Without this, aesthetics ceases to be aesthetics. And here is the minimum demand, not only of aesthetics, but of the simplest cultured society. Tell them to sweep out this rubbish, wash the floors and the windows. When all this is done, I'll begin with great enthusiasm, for it interests me. I will begin my work with great, great enthusiasm then. But now I am nauseated. In another condition, you are the director of an establishment which must enlighten society and actors are your closest cultured assistants. Let us remember this and speak to them not as if they were prostitutes and burglars, but people who deserve to be called actors. If what I have said has not insulted you, but has inspired you to the creation of a clean and a good piece of work, give me your hand and let us say goodbye until the next time. If what I have said sounds like an insult to you, let us say goodbye and for the last time. The business of producing plays at that time was at very low ebb. First of all, almost no one was interested in the history of costume. No one made collections of ancient clothes or books on costumes or anything of the sort at all. There were only three styles in vogue in the costumier's shops, Faust, Les Huguenots, and Moliere, if one does not reckon our national boyar fashions. Have you some sort of a Spanish costume like Faust or... Les Huguenots was the question usually asked of the costumiers. We have Valentines, Mephistos, and St. Briers of all colors, was the usual answer. They could not even take advantage of models that were already created for them. For instance, the Meningen players, while they were in Moscow, were kind and generous enough to let one of the Moscow theaters copy the scenery and the costumes of one of the plays that they had produced. But it was impossible to recognize the costumes for every one of the actors for whom they had been made had added his own ideas to the making of the costume, ordered the tailor to add in one place and take away in another, so that in the end all the costumes looked as if they were made for Faust and Les Huguenots. All of the theatrical tailors had their own traditions and did not even want to look at the books and sketches of the artists, and all novelty and change from the usual in the costume was explained by the lack of experience on the part of the artist, 
The tailor was the best judge of how to make the costumes. I divide the artistic work of the Moscow Art Theater into two periods, one from the founding of the theater up to 1906, and the other from 1906 up to the present day. The first period is the continuation of what took place in the society of art and literature when the young and expansive emotion of the amateurs reacted to all that was accidental and in fashion and attracted our attention, carried away our feelings and filled our minds. In these researches of ours, there was a great deal of lost motion. There was no system, no base from which to work, no leading motives, no order. We would throw ourselves to one side and then to the other, taking, taking with us all that we had found before. Having tasted the new, we included it in our baggage and carried it in the opposite direction towards some other modish path. And the way we lost what we had gained before. Much in it was changed because of incorrect use, but some of the important and necessary things remained in the secret warehouses of the soul, or became one with the conquests of our developing technique. The founding of the Moscow Art Theater and popular theater was in the nature of a revolution. We protested against the customary manner of acting, against theatricality, against bathos, against declamation, against overacting, against the bad manner of production, against the habitual scenery, against the star system which spoiled the ensemble, against the light and farcical repertoire which was being cultivated on the Russian stage at that time, the best theaters were monopolized by a group of little gifted dramatists who wrote their empty plays for the benefits of this or that actor, and often at his order and under his direction, or took plays from the German or the French and adapted them for the Russian stage and to Russian life, signing themselves as the adapters of the original writer with the proscript subject taken from. Like all revolutionists, we broke the old and exaggerated the value of the new. All that was new was good simply because it was new. And this was true not only of important things, it was true of little things also. For instance, the ushers and ticket sellers in all other theaters wore evening dress or a court uniform. Ours were to wear a special uniform, which resembled that of the Italian army. Every other theater had a painted curtain that descended and ascended. Our curtain was made of cloth and parted in the center. Although the beginning of the performance was marked by an overture, we banished the orchestra entirely after a few performances. We kept music only when the play demanded it, and even then the orchestra was hidden from the eyes of the audience. But the most important thing was that all the other theaters practiced conventionalized theatrical truth. Fear no more the heat of the sun, nor the furious winter's rages. Thou thy worldly task hast done, home art gone, and take thy... And we wanted another, a real, artistic, scenic truth. Those who think that we sought for naturalism on the stage are mistaken. We never leaned towards such a principle. Always, then as well as now, we sought for inner truth, for the truth of feeling and experience. But as spiritual technique was only in its embryo stage among the actors of our company, we, because of necessity and helplessness and against our desires, fell now and then into an outward and coarse naturalism. I cannot describe all the productions of the art theater. There are too many of them, and they would occupy too much space. There were many such stages, or rather lines of effort. Like strands in a braid, they went apart, came together, were lost in each other, came apart again, came together again. 
I will try to take each of the important strands out, so to say, and examine it separately. Each strand I will examine represents a long series of related productions. The first series of productions, typical of our creativeness, traveled along the line of history and manners. In this series there are plays like Tsar Fyodor and The Death of Ivan the Terrible, The Merchant of Venice, Antigone, and also Thurman Henschel, and other plays of manners. In this series, the stage director was the autocrat of the stage, especially in the first years of the existence of the theater. He covered the young and immature actors, of whom many gave great hopes for the future, with the pomp, the outward beauty, the unexpectedness of the production which blinded and amazed the spectator. What else could be done? One was forced to do this because the demands made on the young actors were so great that they could not fulfill them. And second, because the stage director created an outward success, giving time, in such manner, to the young actors to mature and grow stronger. The fact that we conducted ourselves like fiery revolutionists caused us to be called wild sectarians. This behavior was tactless on our part, for it complicated the situation, exciting our enemies and creating larger demands than we were able to meet. Symbolism and Impressionism, continuing to react almost youthfully to all new movements, we struck out in our researches toward the fashionable influence of symbolism, which had just risen on the horizon of art, but we did not forget to take with us all our former baggage, that of history and manners, and that of the intuition of feelings. All of our experiences and the new and very important literary influence, which Nemirovich Danchenko cultivated in our theater. Among the plays and productions in the symbolic sequence I count the works of Ibsen, the works of Maeterlinck, who, although he does not consider himself a symbolist, was felt by us to be an impressionist, Knut Hamson and some others. It's a hard nut to crack, the symbol. It is successful when it has its source, not in the mind, but in the inner soul. In this sense, symbol and grotesque are alike. It is necessary to play a role hundreds of times, to crystallize its essence, to perfect the crystal, and in showing it, to interpret the quintessence of its contents. The symbol and the grotesque synthesize feelings and life. They gather in bright, courageous, and compressed form the multiform contents of the role. We could not create such a symbol at the time I am speaking of for many reasons. First, because of our artistic inexperience. Second, because of the lack of the necessary technique. And third, because we had not yet played each role hundreds of times, nor carried it to compactness and depth compressed by the symbol. And fourth and last, we would not create a true symbol in the works of Ibsen because they are alien to the soul of the Slav. Chekhov did not like Ibsen as a dramatist, although he placed Ibsen's talents very high. He thought him dry, cold, a man of reason. And Ibsen's white horses in Rosmersholm seem to us to be creatures of dry reason, although I am certain that to the Scandinavian this symbol is as near as the chariot of Elijah and its thundering passage across the sky on the stormy day of Elijah is to the Russian. But more is the pity. I was not a Scandinavian and I never saw how Ibsen was played in Scandinavia. Those who have been there tell me that he is interpreted as simply as true to life as we play Chekhov. We also longed for this, but we were too clever when we played Ibsen to reach the results of Chekhov's simplicity and depth. We could not play his works as if they were plays of manners, nor could we play them as if they were plays of the intuition of feelings. In our productions of Ibsen, things and sounds did not live on the stage as they did in our productions of Chekhov. We portrayed him with care, but that was due to the fact that Nemirovich Danchenko was a great student of Ibsen and knew how to interpret 
explain, express, and feel him. But the rest of us were merely echoes. True, among the actors, there was now and then a case of extreme exception. For instance, at the dress rehearsal of Hadda Gabler, I was enthused and carried away by the last scene of Loveborg before his suicide. The mad flight of genius excited me, and I ceased to be clever and gave myself over to intuition. But one moment does not make a role. of social and political moods. The general unrest and the coming revolution brought to the boards of our theater a series of plays that mirrored the social and political mood of discontent, protest, and dreams of a hero who would bravely tell the truth. The censorship and the police administration were at the height of their activity. The blue pencil made endless journeys across the text of the plays, crossing out the slightest hints that might evoke unrest, or the breaking of the peace. There was fear that the theaters would become the arena for propaganda, and to tell the truth, attempts were made in that direction. But true art fades whenever it approaches tendential, utilitarian, unartistic paths. An art tendency must change into its own ideas, pass into emotion, become a sincere effort, and the second nature of the actor. Only then can it enter into the life of the human spirit in the actor, the role and the play. But then it's no longer a tendency, it's a personal credo. The spectator can make his own conclusions and create his own tendency from what he receives in the theater. The natural conclusion is reached of itself in the soul and mind of the spectator from what he sees in the actor's creative efforts. This is a necessary condition. And it is only when such a condition is present that one can think in the theater of producing plays of a social and political character. Were we in the possession of such creative conditions? We knew that Gorky was writing two plays. He had told me of one in the Crimea. It had no name as yet. The other was called Small People. We were interested in the first for in that Gorky had chosen the life of the people he loved, those creatures that once were men who created his fame as a writer. We insisted that Gorky finish his first play at once so that we might open our new theater built for us by Morozov with its production. But Gorky complained about the persons of the play and could not finish it. You see, the trouble is that all these people of mine have surrounded me and are crowding me and themselves and I can't get them to take their proper places or make peace between them. The devil take them. They talk, 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 and they talk so well that it is a pity to stop them. By God, my word of honor. The small people became ripe for production before the first play. Of course, we were glad to get this play too and decided to open our new theater with its production. The trouble was that we had no actor who could take the part of Teterev a contrabasso from the church choir of a provincial town who was the hero of the play. The role demanded a brightly colored individuality and a thundering voice. Among the pupils of our school, there was one who undoubtedly fitted the part. He had the necessary voice. He had served in a church choir and later sang in one of the suburban restaurant choruses. Baranov, that was the name of the pupil whom we cast for the part of Teterev, he was undoubtedly talented, very kind-hearted, but at the same time a drunkard and completely uncultured. It would have been hard to explain to him the literacy subtleties of Gorky's play, but in the role of Teterov, as we were able to see later, his barbarism did him a great favor. He took all that Teterov says and does in the play for the gospel truth. Teterov became for him a real person, a hero and ideal, and thanks to this, the tendencies and thoughts of the author recreated themselves in the soul of the actor. It would have been impossible to reach such seriousness and sincerity in one's relation to the situations in the play and the thoughts of the role portrayed by the use of any technique. What made it possible in the case of Barana 
was his childlike naivete. His, his tetrav was not theatrical. He was a real choir singer, and the spectator felt this at once and appreciated it at its true worth. The rest was in the hands of the stage director. The beginnings of my system. During one performance, one evening, in which I was repeating a role I had played many times, suddenly, without any apparent cause, I perceived the inner meaning of the truth, long known to me that creativeness on the stage demands, first of all, a special condition, which, for want of a better term, I will call the creative mood. Of course, I knew this before, but only intellectually. From that evening on, this simple truth entered into all of my being, and I, I grew to perceive it not only with my soul, but with my body also. For an actor to perceive is to feel. For this reason I can say that it was on that evening that I first perceived a truth long known to me. I understood that to the genius on the stage this condition almost always comes of itself in all its fullness and richness. Less talented people receive it less often, on Sundays only, so to say. Those who are even less talented receive it even less often, even every twelfth holiday, as it were. Mediocrities are visited by it only on very rare occasions, on leap years, on the 29th of February. Nevertheless, all men of the stage, from the genius to the mediocrity, are able to receive the creative mood, but it's not given them to control it with their own will. They receive it together with inspiration in the form of a heavenly gift. Not pretending at all to be a god and to hand out heavenly gifts, I nevertheless put the following question to myself. Are there no technical means for the creation of the creative mood so that inspiration may appear oftener than its want? This does not mean that I was going to create inspiration by artificial means. That would be impossible. What I wanted to learn was how to create a favorable condition for the appearance of inspiration by means of the will. That condition in the process of which inspiration was most likely to descend into the actor's soul. As I learned afterward, this creative mood is that spiritual and physical mood during which it is easiest for inspiration to be born. Today I am in good spirits. Today I am at my best, or I am acting with pleasure. I am living over my part. Means that the actor is accidentally in a creative mood. But how is one to make this condition no longer a matter of mere accident, to create it at the will and order of the actor? If it is impossible to own it at once, then one must put it together bit by bit, using various elements for its construction. If it is necessary to develop each of the component elements in oneself separately, systematically, by a series of certain exercises, let it be so. If the ability to receive the creative mood in its full measure is given to the genius by nature, then perhaps ordinary people may reach a, a like state after a great deal of hard work with themselves, not in its full measure, but at least in part. Of course, the ordinary, simple, able man will never become a genius. But it will help him to approach and in time to become like the genius of one school with the genius, the servant of the same art as the genius. But how was one to reach the nature and the component elements of the creative mood? The solution of this problem had become the regular enthusiasm of Stanislavski, as my friends expressed themselves. There was nothing that I left undone in order to solve the mystery. I watched myself closely. I looked into my soul, so to say, on the stage and off. I watched other men and actors when I rehearsed my new parts or their new parts with them. I also watched them from the auditorium. I performed all sorts of experiments with them and myself. I tortured them. They grew angry and said that I had turned the rehearsals into an experimental laboratory and that actors were not guinea pigs to be used for experimentation. And they were right in their protests. But the chief object of my researches remained the great actors, Russian and foreign. If they, oftener than others, almost always walked the stage in the midst of a creative mood, whom was I to study if not them? And that is what I did. 
And this is what I learned from what I saw in Duz, Yermolovna, Fetorova, Savina, Salvini, Chaliapin, Rossi, as well as in the actors of our theater, when they appeared to best advantage in their roles, I felt the presence of something that was common to them all, something by which they reminded me of each other. What was this quality common to all great talents? It was easiest of all for me to notice this likeness in their physical freedom, in the lack of all strain. Their bodies were at the call and beck of the inner demands of their wills. The creative mood on the stage is exceptionally pleasant, especially when it is compared with the state of strain to which the actor is subject when the creative mood is absent. It can be compared to the feelings of a prisoner when the chains that had interfered with all his movements for years have at last been removed. I luxuriated at this condition on the stage, sincerely believing that in it lay the whole secret, the whole soul of creativeness on the stage, that all the rest would come from this state and perception of physical freedom. I was only made anxious by the fact that none of the actors who played with me or the spectators who saw me play noticed the change which I believed had taken place in me leaving out of consideration the few compliments I received about one or two poses, movements, and gestures that I had stressed. I came to understand the creativeness begins from that moment when in the soul and imagination of the actor there appears the magical creative if. While only actual reality exists, only practical truth, which a man naturally cannot but believe, creativeness has not yet begun. Then the creative if appears. That is the imagined truth which the actor can believe as sincerely and with greater enthusiasms than he believes practical truth. Just as the child believes in the existence of its doll and of all life in it and around it, from the moment of the appearance of if, the actor passes from the plane of actual reality into the plane of another life, created and imagined by himself, believing in this life, the actor can begin to create. Scenic truth is not like truth in life. It is peculiar to itself. I understood that on the stage, truth is that in which the actor sincerely believes. I understood that even a palpable lie must become a truth in the theater so that it becomes art, for this is necessary for the actor to develop to the highest degree his imagination, a childlike naivete and trustfulness, an artistic sensitivity to truth and to the truthful in his soul and body. All these qualities help him to transform a coarse, scenic lie into the most delicate truth of his relation to the life imagined. All these qualities taken together I shall call the feeling of truth. In it there is the play of imagination and the creation of creative faith. In it there is a barrier against scenic lies. In it is the feeling of true measure, and it is the tree of childlike naivete and the sincerity of artistic emotion. The feeling of truth as one of the important elements of the creative mood can be both developed and practiced, but this is neither the time nor the place to speak of the methods. I will only say now that this ability to feel the truth must be developed to such an extent that absolutely nothing would take place on the stage that nothing would be said and nothing listened to without a preparatory cleansing through the filter of the artistic feeling of truth. If this was true, then all my scenic exercises in loosening the muscles as well as in concentration had been performed incorrectly. I had not cleansed them through the filter of spiritual and physical truth. I took a certain pose on the stage. I did not believe in it physically. Here and there I weakened the strain. It was better, now I changed the pose somewhat. Ah, I understood. When one stretches himself in order to reach something, this pose is the result 
of such stretching. And my whole body, and after it, my soul, began to believe that I was stretching towards an object which I needed very much. It was only with the help of the feeling of truth and the inner justification of the pose that I was able more or less to reach the loosening of the muscles in actual life and on the stage during performances. From that time on, all my scenic exercises in the loosening of muscles and in concentration passed under the strict control of my feeling of truth. I established a system of classes and subjects that had never been taught in other schools before. The theory and practice of what is called a system of Stanislavski. Various exercises in the development of the feeling of rhythm, not only in movement, but in the inner sensations and in sight and so on. The process of sight is the raying out of spiritual juices that come from us and enter into us. These rayings out have movement, and once there's movement, there's also its tempo and its rhythm. The same thing is true of the sense of touch. In order to differentiate silk and velvet, one needs another tempo and rhythm than in differentiating the bristles of a clothes brush. To smell ammonia, one needs another tempo and rhythm than in smelling lilies of the valley. If one smells ammonia as one smells lilies of the valley, with rapid breakings in of various duration and rhythm, one runs the risk of burning the whole mucous membrane of the nose. In a series of variegated exercises, I tried to develop in my pupils not the outward rhythm of movement and action, but the inner rhythm of that unseen energy which calls out movement and action. In this manner, I was able to develop in my pupils the sensation of movement and gesture, walking, and the entire inner pulse of life. These are purely practical methods and theses, which are useful in our work, and it would be a mistake to look in them for any scientific basis, from which I feel myself to be very far. To the accompaniment of a pianist's improvisations, the pupils lived for hours in rhythm, explaining in their actions how they felt the music. Relying on the same basis of the sensation of inner rhythm and action, they learned to walk, to do gymnastics, plastic, and other exercises in my system for the development of correct consciousness of self, in which rhythm plays a great and important part. There was a whole series of exercises and classes for the development of the feeling for the word and speech, for an altogether exceptional amount of attention was paid to diction in the opera. I'm not young, and my artistic career approaches its last act. The present evolution of dramatic art begins again its new circle in eternity. In this or in that form, in a larger or lesser degree, I see a repetition of what I saw in my artistic youth. Again, as in our time, there have appeared new people with new ideas, new dreams, demands, criticisms, self-conceit, impatience. New geniuses are born and write their new laws in interdependence with the new conditions of life. My old comrades and I also assume roles that are new to us. We have become the representatives of experience. We have been placed as conservatives with whom it is the holy duty of the innovator to struggle. One must have enemies to attack. Our new role is not so attractive as our old one was, but each generation has its own limitations. I do not complain. I am only constituting a fact. It would be a sin for us to complain. We have lived. More, we must thank the Lord for letting us see with one eye into the mists of the future, into what will come after us. We must try to understand those perspectives, that final goal which attract the young generation. 
It's interesting to be able to live and watch what is going on in the minds and hearts of youth. But in my new position, I would like to avoid playing two roles. It would be possible. What would the present age of perfected invention? To try to enter the voices of dramatic artists on phonograph records and their gestures and mimics on the films of the cinema. And this would give a great deal of help to young actors, but nothing can fix and pass on to our descendants those inner paths of feeling, that conscious road to the gates of the unconscious, which and which alone are the true foundation of the art of the theater. This is the sphere of living tradition. This is a torch which can only be passed from hand to hand and not from the stage, but through personal teaching by the way of the discovery of mysteries on one side and exercises, obstinate and inspired labor for the acceptance of these mysteries on the other side. The main difference between the art of the actor and of all other arts is that every other artist may create whenever he is in the mood of inspiration, but the artist of the stage must be the master of his own inspiration and must know how to call it forth when it is announced on the posters of the theater. This is the chief secret of our art. Without this, the most perfect technique, the greatest gifts are fruitless. And this secret is very jealously guarded. The great masters of the stage, with but few exceptions, not only did not try to disclose this secret to their younger comrades, but they kept it behind an insurmountable barrier. The absence of this tradition sentenced our art to become dilettantism, from the inability to find a conscious path to unconscious creativeness, actors reached destructive prejudices which denied spiritual technique. They grew cold in the surface layers of scenic craft and accepted empty theatrical self-consciousness for true inspiration. I know only one method of combating this so dangerous circumstance for the actor. This is to describe in a well-balanced system all that I have reached after long researches and in this manner give actors and those who long to walk the boards a guide, a series of exercises which may show them practically by way of work over oneself and over the material of the role how the actor may create the conditions that are favorable to true scenic inspiration and in the same manner call it forth at the moments necessary for his art. When I look back over the roads that I have traveled during my long life in art, I want to compare myself to a gold seeker who must first make his way through almost impassable jungles in order to find a place where he may discover a streak of gold and later wash hundreds of tons of sand and stones in order to find at last several grains of the noble metal. And like the gold seeker, I cannot will to my heirs my labors, my quests, my losses, my joys, and my disappointments, but only the few grains of gold that it has taken me all my life to find. May the Lord aid me in this task.